That's what it is. Yeah. Actually, it's a it's a it's a concrete room, carpeted oh. carpeted floor, but concrete room. So unless you have thirty people in here, it uh, it resonates quite a lot. So. All right. I think we're going to start. Uh, we've been streaming on Facebook for about uh, twenty seconds or so. Welcome to those of you who are coming that way through Facebook, and those of you who are here on Zoom, and. Uh, we are going to carry on in the book of Acts tonight, and so if you have a Bible, uh, I encourage you to turn to Acts chapter 12. If you don't, um, I will do my best to sort of keep you focused and where you're at uh, on this. I, uh, you, there are options, of course, if you, if you go online. Uh, the, probably the most uh, efficient online Bible is called Bible Gateway. If you just type Bible Gateway into Google, it'll pop up, and um, the only... And, and so then in the search box, type Acts, A-C-T-S, and then space 12, and that'll bring you right to where we are uh, tonight. Um, and my only suggestion is if it comes up with kind of old-styled English, there is a drop-down menu that will let you choose a whole bunch. And the one I'm reading from will have the initials N-I-V, NIV, stands for New, uh, New International Version. But any of those are going to work for you as long as it's in English. And if you can read other languages, well, so be it. Good for you. All right, so we're going to get going uh, here. I said that last week that we're going to start moving through more quickly. We would basically been sort of moving through uh, on a uh, you know a verse by first basis pretty much for the first for the first uh, eleven chapters, uh, but um, we finished up kind of where we were at, uh, and so tonight we're going to take just a few minutes uh, learning about event an event in Peter's life. And then we're going to then we're going to go to the end of uh, uh, rather right to chapter thirteen, and uh, pick up uh, with uh, Saul, also called Paul, and um, we will see how the Lord calls him out to do his uh, the thing that he's been called to do, and uh, and much much of the the rest of the book of Acts will follow uh, Paul's journeys. So let me just say a quick prayer, and then we will uh, get started in chapter twelve. Though. Father, I do thank you for uh, these nights. Thank you for my friends, those uh, who I'm able to interact with and those who, uh, who join me uh, just simply uh, by viewing. Uh, I pray, Lord, that uh, wherever these persons are, that uh, the presence of your very Holy Spirit will be uh, in their hearts and minds and help them to be vulnerable to hear from you tonight, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so um, you, you, you recall, you know, uh, where we've been getting through in this journey, and we talked about uh, how uh, Peter had been called to go and to, uh, to share the story of Jesus with um, uh, a group of persons who, who did not have Jewish background, and uh, we, we recognized the challenge that represented for him. Uh, you know, he'd heard all the comments about uh, Jesus, you know, uh, coming to bring salvation to every person, but it's, it's quite another thing to sort of get that from your brain and into your heart and into your manner. And we saw a lot of cultural reflexes that were kind of anchored into him that he had to fight his way out of. And, um, uh, and, and that was really forced out of him it's, it's essentially because the Lord uh, gave him that vision about uh, Cornelius and, and his company. And he ends up there in that house of very prominent persons all filled, for the most part, with uh, people who didn't have a Jewish background. Uh, and yet, uh, on that day, we see that uh, those persons uh, not only responded to the invitation to know Jesus, but actually received the Holy Spirit in precisely the same manner that the uh, disciples had in the early, in the, you know, the Jewish followers of Jesus, his disciples, on those first days. Next part, then, where we were last week, we, we see that... Uh, Paul had to sort of give a defense for his actions, uh, an explanation for his actions. And so there's this awakening in the Jerusalem church that really, really, truly uh, God intends to uh, take the message of Jesus' salvation to the whole world. Um, the, this first part of chapter 12 uh, is, is, in fact, the whole of chapter 12 is largely here to just provide historical context uh, for where we're going. So um, we, we're seeing, you know, we've seen how uh, persecution and resistance towards these early Christians um, was, was readily surfacing from within, specifically the Jewish leadership, 
Um, you know, and we also have to have an asterisk beside that because this is a time when the Roman Empire is spread and through, and and uh, these are leaders within the Jewish community, but they don't have autonomy. They, they are subject to to the to the whims of Roman rule, and so they are nevertheless or necessarily kind of touchy about their authority and their privilege, and so. Uh, that was one of the big factors and why they chased down Jesus and had him killed. And, uh, and it is certainly a factor in why they are um, uh, reluctant to, to let the Christians, this Christian group and followers of Jesus grow to any kind of significant um, influence because it's a personal threat to them. Um, so we had read several times about how persecutions had broken out against the church and then we see kind of a season of peace uh, and then back and forth. Here we have, um, again, uh, just where we were the last couple of weeks, where, where Peter discovers for himself that, that uh, this message of salvation is for the whole world, Gentiles included, and then explains that to the church, and they're awakening to that idea. Um, I, my own suspicion is that, um, you know, uh, I think I told you last week, my, my associate pastor Carolyn preached about uh, something which he referred to as micro beliefs, those those things which we kind of hold tight to, which maybe we inherited culturally, but which when we are obliged to sort of step back and take a look, uh, they're really not essential to to the to the conversation at all. They're just sort of a comfortable space for us. And um, it, I, I'm speculating here that the you know not only then are the is the Christian community beginning to sort of like sort of really having to stretch itself beyond what it assumed. Its mission was going to be in discovering that uh, that um, you know, as I said, God was intending to reach to all persons. Likewise, this conversation would have invariably found its way into the Jewish leadership community, hearing that these Christians are not only um, you know proclaiming a Messiah, proclaiming a faith in Jesus, proclaiming that Jesus rose from the dead, all these things that they would have, would have struggled with all along, and and were jealous of the popularity that they were gaining. But they would have probably heard back that the Christians were beginning to now fan out um, into the Gentile community. And, um, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're there um, grumbling about being under Roman oppression and have this enculturated disdain for persons uh, who are not of Jewish origin, uh, the Gentiles, the general category that we would use, um, the, the idea that this group of Christians who you're already frustrated with or frustrated with are beginning to expand into the to the Gentile community is just making you want to dislike them all the more, and um, and uh, and so there's probably this spirit of real frustration emerging in the Jewish community. However, something else comes onto the scene, something that um, we really hadn't seen to this point, um, really even through the time of Jesus' life uh, uh, and through his crucifixion. And the earliest parts of the church, and that is a very decided and intentional opposition that will emerge from Roman leadership. Uh, during Jesus' life, the, the the Roman leadership is pretty passive towards him. Their approach is, you know, when the when the Jewish leadership will complain about the popularity and the teaching of this man, was you deal with him yourself and keep things under control. And you know, the whole trial that Jesus has before Pilate is. Uh, filled with thoughts that, uh, you know, can, uh, the pilot you really can't see any real reason to, to crucify Jesus, but he ends up being uh, appeasing towards the, the Jewish leadership in particular. But here we have a character come on the scene named Herod. Now, how many times have we heard that name? We, Herod uh, is um, confusing when you read that name in the Bible because the truth of the matter is it refers to at least four different persons who go by the title of King Herod. And um, I, um, I found some reference just to sort of give us some, some, some understanding. So we're gonna read about a guy named King Herod in a second. And here's what I said. Um, um, Herod Agrippa I, this is who we're talking about, was nephew of Herod Antipas, who had murdered John the Baptist and grandson of Herod the Great, who would have been the one who had uh, commissioned the soldiers to kill all the children under the age of two at the time of Jesus' birth. So you've got this long heritage of Herods who ascend to the throne, all related, and all who are utterly notorious for their uh, vicious manner of dealing with people. 
And it would appear that uh, Herod, in his desire to, um, to kind of gain favor and stature and influence uh, amongst these Jewish subjects that he is now tasked with, with uh, leading, is he discovers that the Jews don't like the Christians very much. And so, hey, maybe one of the ways that I can kind of get on their side and for them to really have affections for me is if I join them in their persecution of the Christians. And so this is what uh, begins to happen here. And just, uh, by the way, for those of you who are history buffs, um, uh, Herod Agrippa here, um, we're told through some other historical books that he actually had a close relationship with, with the uh, son of the emperor, one Caligula. And you might remember some years ago, there was a, a movie made about Caligula. And if you watched it, you saw a, a man of just uh, uh, walking evil in his whole uh, approach to, to violence and, and hatred of people. And uh, so you wonder if that rubbed off on Herod a little bit along with, of course, his, his rather violent genetic history. At any rate, let me begin reading verse 12. Uh, so there's the context. We've got it. Herod, who's newly appointed, um, wants the Jews to come on side with him, and so decides that persecuting the church would be a good way to gain their favor. Chapter 12, verse 1. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. Um, that's a rather ambiguous translation. It probably means he had his head taken off with a sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and after arresting him, now, now note here, now, now watch the uh, incredible security that's here, and, and we know why, right? Because Peter's been arrested before, and we'd seen how the Lord had seen him to be released from the jail. So, so no doubt some of that legend is still in play, and so we see the, the great extent that Herod goes through to make sure that Peter's not going to get out. Verse 4, after arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So uh, it's going to be probably, you know, as much as a week before Peter's going to get out. And uh, not entirely sure what they mean by four squads of four. Probably means that uh, there would be four persons um, assigned a watch of perhaps four hours at a time. And they would, they would move through it like that. Some speculated that he actually had 16 men. Uh, but that doesn't seem to jive with what we're going to read in a few moments. So, so at their end, the, the point is that you've got, you got four persons specifically tasked with guarding Peter. And uh, if we're right, these guys are going to be fresh the whole time. They're not going to be sort of like, fall, shouldn't be falling asleep after sitting there for hours on end. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood at the entrance. So there's your four persons right there, okay? Uh, he's down in chains. He's got a guard on one side, one guard on the other. It says Peter's sleeping. Uh, we don't know if the others are sleeping, but if, it's, if he's sleeping, it's probably nighttime, and um, um, maybe they fall asleep too. We're not sure and then two sentries at the guard at the at the entrance suddenly an angel of the lord appeared and the light shone in the cell he struck peter on the side and woke him up don't you like being struck to be awakened <laughs> hey. quick get up he said and the chains fell off peter's wrists Jink. that's pretty cool the angel said to him put on your clothes and sandals which would mean, would mean an, a, an outer garment Wrap your cloak around you, follow me, the angel told him. And Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision or, walk, or, or dreaming or something like that. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him, and Peter came to himself. And if we were to continue to read, we'd see that he then goes down to, to a home where he uh, knew uh, some of his disciple friends would be, goes uh, after a bit of a false start at the doorway where, where he doesn't get let in right away. He goes and finds that indeed this group has been there um, 
praying for his deliverance. I think uh, I, I don't want to take too much time here. I, I wanted you to be able to, to catch the uh, the extent of the of the um, the continued persecution, the growing persecution, the violent atmosphere that the early church has to continually kind of work its way through. But the one one significant thing that I I, I want us to catch, and maybe this is more important than anything else I'll say tonight, um, is this, and and that is that um, Luke, the writer, almost certainly includes all of these details about the extent to which Herod has gone to make sure that Peter is not getting anywhere, so as to leave no doubt at all that the only reason that Peter got out was because the church was earnestly praying. There, there's the connection. It's all he says about the church is the church is earnestly praying. And when Peter goes to find them, he discovers indeed that they, they were there praying for his well-being. And, um, you know, I, I am not one that's inclined to, to say, I'll even touch a little, bit, a little bit on this later, that, you know, the Christian church in North America is under attack. I, I know you'll hear that from time to time. Uh, if it's an attack, it's not yet violence, it's simply an attack of indifference, probably largely of our own making. Um, but it does not take much these days for opposition to telling people about the gospel, opposition to the church organizing itself for, for even good works, it does not take much for um, organized, critical, uh, condescending and sometimes outright oppositional resistance to emerge for the church in these days. And if we think that we can somehow move forward effectively um, without that simple line, the church earnestly praying to God for whoever it is that's going out to do their mission, um, we, we we're lost. We, we will not be effective because the reality is that there are, there are forces that are at play and it may not be the simple folks around us and it may not be governance, but there is, uh, there is you know, the forces of darkness which does not want to allow for the light of the gospel to enter into its sphere in any way and we can be as creative and as passionate and as energy filled as we possibly can be in doing the, the, the calling to which God has given to us. But if we do not bury that, immerse it, uh, not bury it, but it, it, it keep the foundation of it, you know, rooted deeply in a pattern of earnest prayer, um, we are going to be profoundly limited. And if I want to sort of stretch this whole story into a metaphor, we may find ourselves um, never ever fully feeling like we've been freed from those who are on either side of us trying to hold us back. We may never feel like the chains have truly been released for us to into vital ministry for the Lord. So um, this little story kind of serves as a bit of uh, a period, as it were, on the activities of the Jerusalem church and Peter in particular. Um, and I, I do think it's kind of fitting for us to get to see this extraordinary miracle that is affected by God on Peter's behalf, um, almost certainly in cooperation with the people who were earnestly submitting themselves desperately to the Lord for his deliverance. If we were to continue to read through the rest of chapter 12, we, we learn about Herod a little bit more and ultimately learn about a rather grisly death that he experiences um, ostensibly because he's quite happy to sort of receive praise as if he's God himself. And uh, the inference that is in the last part of chapter 12 is that God didn't like him uh, taking credit for being God and, and uh, he ends up dying a rather ugly uh, death that's there. Um, so we're going to change gears pretty quickly now and go into chapter 13, but I thought we better just wait for a moment to just uh, see if there's anybody with some questions or comments about this quick story that we've spent with uh, Peter's deliverance from the jail and uh, the life of the church at that point in Jerusalem. Is, is, is it, is it, uh, Peter is not escaping from the jail. He, he's 
Well, the, the, the details here are that an angel of the Lord comes and, and delivers him. The chains literally fall off. Uh, one of the details in the story is uh, as they move past the guards, as they come to an iron gate, and it says the, the gate opened by itself. So there's, there's little doubt that there's divine intervention going on in this whole thing. It's not just, a, you know, Luke wants us to know it's not just a group of, of Christians who have sort of sneaked past the other guards and broken in, and, and it's, it's not a jailbreak. He's, he's being led free by God himself. I keep looking at the wrong camera. I've switched my, my, my pattern here. The, the camera that I'm at right now is looking at uh, Facebook, and so it, to you guys on Zoom, it probably looks like I'm looking down. So I need to come up to here to, to, to look at you. But Okay, good. Any other questions then about this, this story in Chapter 12? Uh, any historical details that I might be able to help you with? Okay, let's uh, skip ahead then to chapter 13. And uh, here is really where uh, the book really makes a dramatic shift in its whole orientation, including, uh, for the most part, where the story, you know, the very physical space where the stories will unfold. We, uh, we visited Antioch last week in our studies, and uh, we knew that Barnabas had called and, and brought Saul back to there from Tarsus. And we heard about their effective uh, teaching ministry that it had for uh, about a year there. And just to remind you that Saul had had, uh, you know, 10 to 14, depending how the, the historians put it together, 10 to 14 years since his actual conversion. And so plenty of time to reflect upon and to continue to grow in his knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures. And, um, and you know, for those of who us who may be sometimes impatient to get to where we want to get, there's a lesson there that you know we kind of read through the story quickly and we assume that, that Saul's saved and then he's you know a vital part of the church's ministry from that point forward. We see he gets used occasionally, but it's a it's a long wait really before he is uh, really embraced by the church for this role of ministry. And anyway, we're in Antioch, and so I'll just begin reading in chapter 13 and. Uh, I'm going to end up jumping a little bit because it's just uh, I, I just have kind of chosen one sort of core theme to revisit uh, as we move forward here. Chapter 13, verse 1 goes like this. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. And we know that. Remember, there, there is this combination that this, this last week when we read that some prophets came down and they told about uh, the, the great um, uh, famine that would, would come. And that was what motivated those, that group of Christians to start digging from their own pockets and, and prepare an offering for back in Jerusalem. Um, so there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. So, you know, that was a rather radical conversion to move from out within this whole circle of the, of the Herods. Uh, and Saul. Now, now, listen to this carefully. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Now, again, here's a good example of, you know, it's, this is all in one paragraph, so it ha sounds like it's just sort of happening, you know, kind of like this. Uh, but there are some cues that help us to understand that we need to sort of stretch out the timeline a little bit, slow down the pace of what, what's unfolding for us. Um, you know, so that so the worshiping the Lord. Uh, probably we need to to break away from just the picture of the hour long service that begins at eleven and ends at twelve oh one, so you can get to the uh, Swiss chalet before the Baptists arrive. It's um, probably this this pattern of worshiping together because it's, it's bracketed with fasting. And, um, you know, you, you go for a couple of hours, you might feel hungry, but fasting really is, is, is you know, really denotes sort of an extended period of time of, of going without, without food. Uh, you might remember Jesus' instructions to those who, who fast, you don't, don't make a show of it, but put oil on your face, like do what you can to make yourself look like this, there's nothing going on, but you're just quietly, earnestly, secretly, uh, fasting before the Lord, giving up this 
the, this food as a way of, of just sort of focusing your, your heart and mind. And so the fact that they've been fasting probably indicates that this, this season of worship is, is uh, as much uh, as it might be singing or anything like that, it is, it is most particularly expressed with this focused desire to want to simply honor God and to hear from God. And I'm not going to get busy doing anything else except to focus upon the Lord, hear from Him, honor Him with my life, wait for the Lord. So this, this, this worship and fasting is, is as much focus and attitude uh, and posture uh, as it is any kind of a, a service that there may have been. What we're told is that while they were worshiping, uh, the Holy Spirit said, then tell us to whom the Lord speaks, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. Now, in other words, an impression from the Holy Spirit uses the word said, so perhaps there was some audible experience, maybe it was a tongues experience, we're not really sure. But somehow or other, uh, there's an impression that has entered into this group uh, in a manner where there's this, this, this crisp, clear sense that Saul and Barnabas are meant to be commissioned, set apart, sanctified uh, for a work that God has in mind for them. Now, again, just so we don't raise ahead too quickly, uh, as we kind of slow these things down here, uh, notice that in verse 3 then it says, so I'll read, the, I'll read the words of the Holy Spirit, are set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then verse 3 says this, so after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Um, maybe, uh, maybe I'm reading too much into this, but that sounds to me like they kept praying and they kept fasting, even after this clear sense of commissioning and calling was at play within the circle. And in, in my own experience and in my idea in this is that probably, probably there was this very sober pattern along with whatever ecstatic experience that they had there was also this very sober pattern that effectively said this and forgive me if this sounds um you know uh, a little flippant but but it's uh, I, in my mind it's playing out something like this saul says did you hear what i just heard and barnabas says i don't know what did you just hear and he says, I think we're supposed to be commissioned to, to, to go on a missionary journey. And Barnabas says, that's kind of what I think that I heard as well. And, and the idea that I'm hearing here is that once this impression is at play, they then continue in this pattern of praying and fasting together until they knew that they knew that they knew. Now, I want to tell you that in my own life's experience, when I have been trying to discern uh, the will of God in a circumstance. There is a pattern that I have uh, practically adopted for myself, and I think it's what I'm trying to describe here. I hope I'm consistent with that. And that is, is if, uh, if I've been praying very specifically uh, about a person, a task, some, some issue, some, something in which I need to have some clear sense of direction about how I'm to speak or what I'm supposed to do or where I'm supposed to go, um, I pay attention to the impressions that come to my heart, and uh, and 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 I and I and I test them. I I, I test those impressions. I want to be sure that what's coming to my mind is, you know, to to, to borrow the old phrase from from Sheldon, um, is this what Jesus would do? Um, you know, in, in other words, this impression that I have is it really consistent with the heart of God? And then instead of just getting up and going off and saying, okay, I've heard from the Lord, I know what to do, um, I, I wait for others to confirm it. Uh, not, not just anybody, not just you know, the, the, the grocer at the store or something like that. Uh, people that I trust and know are God-fearing and, and focused in their own prayer lives. And their, I, I, I just I, I listen and wait for something to come from one of them. And, and I try not to do any kind of leading, right? You know, sort of sow the seeds so that I can kind of coax out a, an answer for them. The Lord has spoken to me through these impressions. I just want to know that, that I'm on the right track. And invariably, um, someone will say something or speak of a circumstance that absolutely nails it 
for me. And I know then that I know I've heard from the Lord in this thing. And so I think that something like that is what we see unfolding here. When we slow down the clock a little bit and just let it unfold, taking into consideration, you know, this whole fasting formula and things like that, is that they took plenty of time and somehow when they had got themselves good and focused in their worship of the Lord, this impression or this voice or this word came from through the Holy Spirit that they were to actually commission Saul and Barnabas now for a journey. And the that simple language, so after they had fasted and prayed. So in other words, once they were finally done, I, I'm reading in a little bit, but I'm taking that to mean that, uh, that they, they, they prayed through. They, they made sure that they were certain that they all understood what the Lord was calling them to do. And so it says, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. Um, I like that. Um, wonder if we need to do more of that these days. I, I wonder if we need to uh, be more particular that when someone feels like um, the Lord is directing them, and this doesn't have to be a call to missions or a call to preach or, or a call to go anywhere, but just a sense that I'm supposed to, you know, spend some time with my neighbor more. Um, I wonder if it might not be appropriate then for me to say, well, here, let, let me pray over you in this sense of calling that you have. It's really subtle. Like nobody has to know that you're going to spend more time with your neighbor. But this idea, if this is what God's called you to do, why not let the church represented by a, a brother or a sister uh, pray over you, lay a hand on you and, and say, Lord, God, bless these initiatives of this person who's just trying to be obedient to your guidance. So beginning at verse 4, we see them head off to the city of Cyprus. And then at verse 13, they're going to move on uh, to, um, they were going to carry on to Paphos, and then they're going to go to a place called the city in Antioch. And the whole thing moves rather quickly with some, some stories that are intermixed with them. And it would be very tempting to take uh, time to really chew on the stories. And I wish we could do that, but I think we just won't make our target of being done before the summer's here if we stop at all these stories. So make sure you take some time with the scriptures and, and dig around in them. And if, if something comes up in, the, in a passage in between what I'm teaching on, uh, go ahead and ask questions and I'll do my best to try to answer uh, what it is that, that, that you're looking for. Where I, where I want to go tonight is to just follow this notion of their calling and their, their being set apart and, and prayed over for their tasks. So, so if I was doing a, a four-point sermon, you're going to get four points. The first one was, is, is the, the idea to serve or to go is, is God's idea. It, it was God who said, set these two apart. And if there's an impression in your mind to do anything in the name of Jesus, it is because God himself is the one who's initiating it and calling you to that task. And so we see that in these, and, and, and off they go. Uh, they're not alone, um, but we hear the reference to the two of them, because it's now going to be targeted around um, uh, Paul, uh, Saul and uh, Barnabas. So verse 4 says, The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish, Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. So there's your third party. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. Bar is a Jewish uh, prefix meaning son of, so the son of uh, someone named Jesus or Yeshua. It would have been Joshua being a fairly common name amongst the Jewish communities. Bar Yeshua, um, who was an attendant of the proconsul, Roman leader, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. Now stop right there. Um, I said God is one who's going to, to, he's the one who will call you to this task. 
Um, he's calling you the task because he's, he's, he's got the details up ahead already planned out for you. Th these men have been commissioned to go in the opposite direction from Jerusalem. They are going out into all the world, and the Lord has already prepared persons to hear from them, and persons in unexpected places, including right here uh, at uh, one Sergius Paulus, the proconsul, an intelligent man, uh, the proconsul and an intelligent man who wants to hear the word of God. In other words, God's calling you to go and do something. Um, it's, you, you're not tumbling into a vacuous place, but you're rather going to be being led along to a place where there are persons ready to, being ready to hear or to receive from you what God has called you to do. And in this case, it's a, a Roman uh, leader whose name is Sergius Paulus, and we would short Paul, shorten Paulus down to Paul, and all the way through the first half of Acts, I keep referring to Saul as Paul, because down through history, that becomes the dominant name for him, and we'll learn in a moment that uh, he has two titles, he has two names, Saul is a very Jewish name, Paul is a very Roman name, Paulus, and uh, you'll discover as we move along that uh, Saul and his family are actually Roman citizens. Not wasn't common, but it was uh, wasn't entirely unknown for uh, Jewish families to be granted the privilege of Roman citizenship. Uh, we know that we're going to learn that 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 Saul and his family were tent makers for the Roman army, and so perhaps in their faithful service in support of those initiatives, they were granted uh, Roman citizenship. Point being here is that uh, we're going to learn right away just how incredibly pragmatic Saul is. Because now that their ministry has shifted and it is now going to be overwhelmingly among uh, uh, Gentile cities, they'll, they'll always make a stopping point among the Jewish communities in those cities. But they're going to have a large audience with Gentile uh, uh, persons. Um, he's going to very pragmatically and practically shift to his other name, Paul, um, so that he has a reception amongst those who are not from Jewish extraction. Um, there are some people who think that, that Saul was jettisoned uh, and Paul became his new name, but in fact, uh, the inferences that we have here is that he, he goes by both names. And uh, Saul doesn't get jettisoned, it's just that Paul, Saul Paul, begins to operate so much in the non-Jewish communities that Paul becomes a more advantageous title to use. So um, we meet Sergius Paulus, who's ready to hear um, from um, God's commissioned servants, Barnabas and Saul, the Paul. Um, there's a story here about this uh, Bar Yeshua, Bar Jesus character. He also goes by the name Elimas. Um, he's referred to as sorcerer, and the story will will talk about how uh, this guy tries to discourage uh, Peter uh, and, or rather, Paul and Barnabas, and uh, and um, uh, some rather nasty things are called down upon this mind. The hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind, and for a time you'll be unable to see the light of the sun, and that happens to the poor fellow. So I've said to you that uh, the, the Lord calls you, the Lord prepares a place for you. I'm going to show you yet another, how that happens yet again right here. Verse 13. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them and returned to Jerusalem. From Perga, they went to the Pisidian Antioch, and on the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. That's you know, it's the Sabbath, that's what Jews do. They go and they worship at the synagogue, and they found this, the community of Jews that were there, and they go in. It says, um, after the reading from the law and the prophets, the synagogue rulers sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a message of encouragement for the people, please speak. Bingo, here again. Uh, these two have arrived into the city, and uh, automatically uh, this this audience is given to them to speak into the hearts and minds of these persons who had gathered there. Perhaps something of the story of them being messengers or servants of Jesus had preceded them. Um, uh, I would suppose so. 
Uh, and so maybe that was why. But, but here again, they have gone now further and further afield. And, uh, and there's an audience waiting to hear from them yet again. The next uh, long section describes uh, a sermon preached by Paul. And um, what is striking, if you were to, to, to read through it, is that you would find that there's some similar patterns to the way that Stephen preached and the way that uh, Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. And that is to, to root and anchor the story of Jesus in the whole history of God's coming to his people. And uh, so he will take them on a long journey of, of describing how God had been preparing his people and caring for his people and always promised that at some point he would bring a deliverer to them. And, uh, and so they, this, Paul just very skillfully brings this uh, story in to uh, the story of Jesus. Uh, and verse 38 then, we kind of, I'll pick up at the kind of last part of his sermon there. He says, Therefore, my brothers, I want you to know that through Jesus the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is justified from everything that you could not be justified from by the law of Moses. Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. And then he will quote a section from Isaiah that would have been known to them. He says, look, this is something that's so important. Listen, I, maybe all of us need to hear this tonight. Anybody who's watching me tonight on, on Facebook and you're not sure that uh, you're ready to, to follow this, this, this journey and to... And to, and to to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. These words were written a long, 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 long time ago. It says, look, you scoffers, wonder, perish, for I'm going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. And so this, this, this message from God, from Isaiah the prophet, 700 and, oh, let's say 780 years before the day that we're reading about here, this uh, ancient word says, listen, you, you can scoff, you can mock, but I'm going to do something uh, that um, you, you won't even believe. Now, watch. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things the next Sabbath. Cool, huh? And when the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. And so on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered for them. So not only then is God preparing us, he's the one who's going to call us, and not only is there going to be a receptive audience for us, um, but um, there is, I think, an expectation that when we know it was God who said we were going to do this, uh, not only can we expect uh, to have a, a welcoming audience, and, and audience is maybe not the right word, but just a, a, someone who's going to receive us, but uh, there's fruit that's beginning to emerge here. It's subtle. It's just simply uh, people who are saying, we'd kind of like to know more. And, and I would just say to you, look for that. Look for those opportunities. And we may not be talking about a conversation where you're, teaching somebody it may be just where you are expressing love for people in a manner that that, that that would honor Jesus and a person who might have been reluctant to let anybody into their circle might at last begin to say I appreciate what you're doing and and, and embrace that and, and, and accept it and, and 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 believe that that is you know the the, the intentions of God uh, working through this now, there's one last stop then before we're done for the night, and that is um, um, uh, I'll just read it through from verse 46 and following, and I'll get to the end of the chapter, and then and I'll just point out what I want you to hear, and, and we'll be done. So verse 46, then Paul and Barnabas answered uh, them boldly, said, um, uh, I better back up. So on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. That's a big party. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. We've seen that story before. They were filled with jealousy, and they talked abusively against what Paul was saying. And Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first, since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life. A little sarcasm there. We now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us 
I've made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Well, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord. And all who were appointed for eternal life believed. Verse 49. Uh, the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. But the Jews incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. And so they shook the dust from their feet and protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Um, you, you, you or I uh, cannot walk in obedience to the Lord and expect that there will never be opposition to what we're doing. If, if there is never any pushback, I'm just going to say you may have strayed somewhat from the path God's called you to. Now, now let me be clear. I, I just talked that there, we should expect receptive audiences, and we should expect to see some, some welcoming and some warming to the things that we're saying. I mean, they, they, God just, doesn't just send us into a, uh, you know, a, a place of horrible rejection and persecution. Uh, but neither will we escape that. We just won't, because in this world there are those, and as I alluded to earlier, there are those forces that simply do not want to make place for Jesus. And if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to run into those people. Bottom line. Right? Well, uh, we just did two chapters. How about that, hey? We keep going at that pace, we actually might get all the way through. So, any questions or comments? Either uh, I, I've got the feed going on Facebook, so if you've got a question, go ahead and type it in, and I'll and I'll relate that to these guys. All right, then we're going to be done for the night. Thank you all for uh, being here. We'll be back here again next Wednesday evening. And uh, those of you who are on Facebook Live, um, why not try the Zoom app sometime? Some of you I see almost every week, and um, it's, it's kind of a delightful way to do it. Uh, these people aren't scary. And uh, um, the opportunity for, it helps me to be able to see some faces and, uh, and to catch expressions. Uh, and uh, you don't have to. You, 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 can, you can come and just be a D on, on the screen, too. We have at least one person that comes pretty regularly and doesn't let us see who they are, but that's okay. Anyway, thank you all for being here. To those of you on Facebook uh, Live, I'm glad that you joined us tonight. Lord bless you. And those of you who have been on Zoom, thanks again for being here tonight. We'll see everybody next week. Thank you very much. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hold on, hold on. Oh, so, yeah, Jim, go ahead. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just go ahead. Like, like the Facebook Live is, you know, it's there. So if you have questions at any time, Put them on there, and indeed, if you don't want to be public with your questions, send me a private message, and I'll be glad to, to respond to you that way as well. All right, thanks, Jim, for that clarification. We'll see you all. God bless. Have a good night. Thank you. And uh, so long, Facebook Live. <laughs>